Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast with Dr. Brett Scher. Today I'm joined by Dr. Hasina Kaji. Now, Dr. Kaji started as a physician in South Africa, running an acute care ward in a tertiary hospital. And you'll hear her say it seemed like her dream job, which she always aspired to be as a doctor. But it didn't take long for her to realize she was kind of missing the mark on where she could have the biggest impact. And through a number of different experiences, which you'll hear, she realized that she could impact people much better with a low carb lifestyle to help them to prevent even showing up in the acute care ward. So she transitioned her practice and also she got involved with social action, with public health, especially in the poor communities of South Africa, working with the Eat Better South Africa campaign with the Noakes Foundation and the Nutrition Network. And she's actually currently the, the medical director of the Nutrition Network. And through her outreach, she has helped thousands of people understand the importance of nutrition, the importance of health, and has helped people adopt a low-carb lifestyle in a culturally sensitive way and in an economic uh, sensitive way. And those are lessons I think we all need to take away that there's not just one way to eat. There's not just one way to eat even low carb. And we have to be sensitive about the individual individuality of people, about their cultural norms, about their ethnicity and their history, and kind of de help devise a way for people to be healthy in ways that work for them. She also has some strong beliefs well beyond nutrition about healthy lifestyles and the mind-body connection, all of which I think are such important lessons for us all to hear. So I hope you have some good takeaways and really enjoy this interview with Dr. Hasina Kaji. Dr. Hasina Kaji, thank you so much for joining me on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It is surreal being here, having watched other podcasts, and to now be a guest. It's amazing. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I'm honored to hear that. That's great. Well, I want to hear more about your story because we spent some time talking yesterday, and you have a pretty phenomenal story. So tell me, if you can, as far back as you want to go about how you got started in medicine and kind of what your philosophy was and the experience you had in, in trying to help patients. Right. So I think I started, like most doctors, wanting to from the deepest part of my heart, help people. Yeah. And um, the thing that bothered me along the way was the, the way medicine became um, broken up into fractions. And so the surgeons, there was a hierarchy within the medical world that I noticed very early on. And I actually started out wanting to become a, a, a surgeon. That was my, that, really? that was the route I was going. And I did surgery and I just, I there was a relationship that was lacking between the colleagues. And I became more intrigued with the human body and the functionings of the body and the pathophysiology. And so I eventually, I, I actually did uh, almost two years of emergency medicine. And then I became tired of the trauma, mm -hmm. a lot of trauma in South Africa. And I was more interested in the why behind chronic disease. And where in South Africa were you training? So I trained um, in a university under University of Cape Town, okay. which means we go through the various hospitals in the metropole. Um, and I became fascinated with, even during my training with obesity. And to me it seemed, it, it was quite stupid that something that was so widespread had a very seemingly easy answer and the more I read and the more I learned I obviously realized it wasn't as easy as it seemed eventually I specialized and um, got my dream job at the time um, I actually stopped working for a little while when my uh, daughter was born I was pregnant during my final exam so so family is really important to me and uh, my husband and I wanted to have uh, our kids have either a parent home and as much as I had uh, career aspirations, being a mom suddenly made me feel like, whoa, how am I supposed to work now? Uh, so, I mean, that's, my husband and I kind of swapped roles there for a little bit when I was offered this dream job once I had specialized as a specialist physician. And he stayed home. Uh, he's also an emergency physician. He oh, wow. stayed home for a little while. He worked after hours. But in climbing this ladder and eventually reaching this goal, dream job, my heart broke wide open because all around me in my 10 bed high care unit, I was meeting patient after patient, a lot of them under the age of 30 coming in with cardiovascular disease, coming mm. in with their first heart attack. 
And not only was that the problem, their wives were overweight, their children were walking into the unit carrying um, crisps and cool drinks. And it was just, you know, there was so much work to do. My nursing staff were overweight and I would talk to patient after patient on the ward round. Sometimes I'd have the entire unit paying attention to the lecture I was giving to one patient. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was just, it was desperate. It still is. And eventually I had the nurses on the program. Just having listened in and making tiny changes, I started a low-carb clinic for the patients I was seeing in the high-care unit. But it became too much to sustain, and I felt like I was standing at the edge of the cliff catching one or two patients, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get them way before... I'd, n- I'd never wanted to meet them in the emergency unit. Yeah. It's amazing you know? that you, this was your dream job, right? This right. is what you were sort of trained and, and bred for to do, that you're going to impact people this way. And then when you got there, you realized the impact that you need to have is 10 years earlier, Absolutely. 15 years earlier. Much, yeah. much earlier. You know, in, in the prenatal level even, you know, my belief is that the people to change this are the mothers because let's face it, as much as we're growing uh, worldwide and we have equal rights, the mothers are still mostly involved in um, uh, creating, you know, in diet, in what the children eat and what the mothers eat when they're pregnant. And, you know, it's about educating people, firstly, about what can go wrong. And it's not too difficult because most of them are terrified that they're going to develop diabetes because they've cared for a family member who's been diabetic and only lived for a few years after their amputation or a few months. So that's my my, my passion is educating people in a simple way that speaks to them, you know, from the heart to the heart. Right. Um, and as much as I had success I would say you know in terms of people taking the message understanding the message and trying to translate that into into a practical way of life it was just too few people um, it, it was too far specialized I felt um, to be reaching enough people yeah oh it's interesting that you were also reaching the nurses at the same time yeah. I think that shows sort of just the, the prevalence of of whether it's obesity and metabolic disease and the lack of knowledge about right. it. It sort of has become the new norm, at least Absolutely. in the United States it certainly has. It's the same in South Africa. It's like people didn't even sort of bat an eye at it. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, you know, it's it's the norm. And then we have the culture issue in South Africa, especially the African communities. The bigger you are, the richer you are. Mm. And when people start to lose weight, there's the stigma associated with HIV yeah. So, you know, we, we have many different hurdles. Um, yes, but it, it was just shocking to me that it was the norm, that cool drinks and even the porters in the hospital earning a much lower salary would use that little income to go to the shop and to buy a cool drink. And I would say, well, I don't, I don't, I, I drink water from the tap because we've got actually great water coming out of the tap. So what about... Yeah. You know, so I assume cool drink is like a soda. Oh, a soda, right? yeah. yes, that would be a soda. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I gotta learn the South African <laughs> lingo, right? So then you had this transformation. You mm-hmm. you realize you're not having the impact you want to have on people, and you started a low carb clinic. You said for right. the people in the acute care. And what was what was the reaction of your colleagues of the hospital mm-hmm. of the medical societies? What kind of reaction did you get? So you know, it was it was. Uh, I was very lucky to be in a department that was very supportive, meaning the emergency department. And as long as it was science-based, they were very happy about that. Um, But unfortunately, I worked very closely with other specialists and other departments. Mm -hmm. Um, And that wasn't taken very uh, very well, the fact that... uh, So so in, in a hospital, like I think in most hospitals around the world, nutrition is not a doctor's department. You should be dealing with nutrition. It's the dietetics department. And the dietetics department refused to get involved. So I approached the chief dietitian and said, I'd like to talk to you about this. And um, she didn't return my emails. She I, and I found out, um, you know, through the grapevine that she felt that she was not educated enough in low carb treatments to have a conversation with me. 
Hmm. So I tried even higher and, you know, we faced a lot of issue, a lot of hostility within the department, colleagues coming into the department and tearing up um, diet sheets or, or food lists that we'd given to the patients. And physically tearing physically them up. Physically opening up the folder going, hmm, what's this, squash it or tear it up. Oh, my goodness. And thankfully, you know, South Africa is still very, the patients are very um, old fashioned still in terms of do what the doctor says mm -hmm. and don't question the doctor. And I was on a mission to empower my patients to ask questions. In fact, when the patient asked a question, they would say, I'm so sorry, doctor, to ask. And I'd say, but it's your body. Please do ask. Yeah. There isn't the tolerance or the time to answer those questions because of how busy it is and, you know, all the hurdles all around the world, I think, are the same or are similar. Um, and we had patients coming in, actually, having been on a low-carbohydrate diet for a couple of years, speaking to a cardiologist, and the cardiologist was saying, this is terrible, you're going to die, your cholesterol. And they would say, thank you very much, doctor, but I know that this diet has helped me get off my blood pressure pills. I've lost weight. I respect your opinion, but I'm not getting off the diet. So we had, we, we, we still have patients who, who are, I, I think it's, it's a revolution in the patient world as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's so impressive to hear when you started that statement by saying they very much just listen to their doctor and feel like they're inconveniencing mm. their doctor to ask questions. I mean, that's to go from that to being empowered enough to say, no, I, I know what I'm doing is benefiting me. I'll stay the course. I mean, that's yeah. an amazing transition, and I'm sure it was very difficult. But you, you sort of can't talk about low carb in South Africa without bringing up Professor Noakes. I right. mean, I'm sure his his presence is, is everywhere. So how much do do the other doctors know about him or his message or his challenges? And and how pervasive is that? And does that make your job any easier or harder having him kind of led the way? So it's such a difficult question to answer. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, all of South Africa respects Professor Noakes for... Um, his sports science career and my personal feeling is that when he started to talk about nutrition that there was a lot of ego egos that got into um, the ring there and people felt that he wasn't qualified he, he was qualified to speak about sports nutrition but he wasn't qualified to speak about diet and certainly not diet that went against um, you know what the current medical dogma and Having that association with him in a tertiary level hospital for me was actually more difficult to practice medicine because a lot of people were against what he was saying and what he yeah. was teaching. But on the other hand, it's quite divided because people who... So this is my view that if you're a doctor and you've never had a weight issue, it's very easy to say this is rubbish, just eat less and move more. When you are a doctor and you gain weight and you know the physical aspects and the physiological aspects and the clinical association of that weight gain, then you have a personal responsibility to, and if you have a personal responsibility to improve your health or you, know, you, you want to improve your health, then you start looking at different options. And it's only then that people will realize exactly how difficult it is to eat less and move more. Yeah, I think it's sad that we sort of rely upon doctors to have their own personal experience before Absolutely. they can learn about it. And that's sort of what I see as our job here, not not just educating the individual person, but educating the doctors or allowing that individual patient to educate their doctor Absolutely. because we have to speed up the process somehow, right. don't There's we? no individuality in medicine. Everyone's yeah. supposed to eat exactly the same thing. Yeah. Right. I mean, how can we think with our with our diverse backgrounds and ethnicities and cultures that in our genetics that there's one diet for everybody? Just Absolutely. doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah. But I think the thing that bothered me the most was that everybody knows in tertiary level medicine, uh, or even you know in the regional hospitals, any doctor in South Africa knows how prevalent obesity is, mm -hmm. and to have somebody as um, esteemed as Prof Noakes coming to the forefront and saying, look. So firstly, you have to be blind to see, to not be able to see his physical transformation. Yeah. You know, and then f for somebody of that caliber to say, I felt sick, I got better, I've done the research, this is what works. If you really care about obesity, and if you really want to make a difference, and you can see that somebody has a solution, 
And he's not some Tom, Dick or Harry. He's an esteemed A1 rated scientist. Why is it not possible for you to be able to sit at the table with him and discuss? Wow, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. In fact, when Eric Westman came to South Africa, I arranged a meeting um, at the University of Cape Town for the clinicians to attend. While it was reasonably well attended, it was not at all well received. There was much hostility in the room from various departments. And it was so clear that no matter how much science is out there, some people will refuse to listen. Why is that? Because, you know, you, we want to give people the benefit of the doubt that physicians are here to help their patients. So why do they get so dug in sometimes that they can't be open-minded enough to look for other opportunities to, mm. to help their patients? Why do you think that is? Um, look, I have no idea. I think ego has a, a huge role to play. I think that people are treading on other people's territories. Uh, perhaps that's the issue. Um, to me, you know, obviously when it came up and people were saying, uh, Prof Noakes was saying, eat high fat. I was like, personally, I thought, this is nonsense. You're going to die. Right. And then I thought, but no, no, no. But this is Prof Noakes. So I need to do a little bit more research. And then I was like, I mean, the way I, I, I practice is I never ever practice. I always practice what I preach. So I have to do the, th the whatever it is, I'll take it up personally, whether it be fasting or extended fasting um, or budget eating. And how can I prescribe to my patients what I don't know when I don't know what it feels like? Yeah. And I felt my husband was a couple of uh, maybe 20, 15 to 20 kilos overweight, no matter how much we ran and no matter how well we ate. And I noticed an immediate transformation. He used to, we used to call him the Hoover because he would just finish everybody's meals. And Use that term sudden, even in South Africa, huh? Do. <laughs> That's and, great. And he, all of a sudden, he was satiated. Mm -hmm. And I kept making him low-carb desserts. And after the third day, he said, what are you doing? And I said, I just want to spoil you. He said, please don't, because for the first time in my life, I feel like I have control over what I'm eating. Yeah, you know. So it's when you experience that. I'll tell you stories from being working in the emergency department. There's no time to to go to the loo. There's no time to have lunch. And when I started eating low carb, well, I had been for a while before I started that job, and um, I would keep going without eating, and I wouldn't have had breakfast. And my interns would look. Hanger, they would be hangry, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I remember an intern coming up to me and saying, "You need to tell me what you're doing because I, I I'm going to kill someone. I need to eat now, and you just look so serene." You know, it's it's like that across the board. And I used to have this issue with the body, this fascination with the body that the body is remarkable. But how come we have to stop so many times a day to eat? And yeah. if we don't eat, we feel crazy. So it's, it, it, it was a personal transformative journey for myself. Um, and that is the thing I think that's lacking, that people have no, in my experience, people have the professionals that I had these discussions with and debates with. It felt like they just read an abstract and they quoted the abstract. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, th they don't have time to read the low-carb literature because they're too busy reading their own department's literature. So whether it's a hepatologist or a cardiologist or an immunologist or whatever it is, they just don't have the time to read. But, you know, why not talk through the information or be guided yeah. or be willing to be guided? And that's the danger of our sort of over-specialized medical yeah. society that everybody, you know, the stay in your lane or the super narrow focused lane that you take care of your one body part, but right. kind of forget that that's connected to the Absolutely. rest of the body. And overall health is what we all need to be taking care of at the base and then focusing on the one body part. Right. Yeah. I think that's a huge flaw, flaw in medicine. If you look at Iva speaking about how, um, in uh, coming, speaking about how, engineers that there's an engineer to look after all engineers and you you have you might have the super specialization but there's still somebody looking at 
the whole picture, and we don't have that in medicine. It's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so you went on from helping one person at a time to having more of a role in public outreach and helping right. entire populations with the Eat Better South Africa campaign, where you're dealing with a lot of poor communities without a lot of resources, and that must have been challenging to really get the message across and whether it was to convince people it was the right thing to do and logistically help them. Tell us about your involvement there and kind of what you saw. So uh, when um, I was when I, when I realized there's a huge issue and Prof has the solution, I contacted him to say there's this problem because this is being viewed as the rich man's diet mm -hmm. and the people who need it are the poor. Right. So he put m me in contact with Jane Budin, the CEO of uh, the Noakes Foundation at the time, and we met in a little, little coffee shop with a local celebrity, an actress, um, and um, somebody who's very passionate about improving life, Yodia Sampson, in South Africa. And she had been in touch with fitness groups in the poorer communities where they would meet in community centers and um, exercise to be healthy. And they were just not getting results. And that was how Eat Better South Africa was founded. We, uh, there was a particular community in Ocean View in the um, southmost tip of Africa. Mm -hmm. And these people were just so passionate about improving their health. And so behind Eat Better South Africa is a huge team of people, including many volunteers. Um, and so we met, we, we, we had a, a game plan. What we needed, we needed was somebody within the community who, who people would trust, who had also had some experience with a low carbohydrate diet. And Yodia Samson ticked that box. Oh. And then we formalized a program of education. So we s uh, met the community, it was about 40 people the first time, did blood pressures and um, had bloods done, um, checked sugars, and you know took uh, readings, uh, abdominal circumference, and those kinds of things. And then there would be uh, in the community center, we would either give a talk, an educational talk about what insulin resistance is, just explaining how insulin resistance is the root cause of disease in a very simple format. I'm sure it was the first time any of these people had ever even heard of the Absolutely. topic or the concept, right? Yeah. And we came up with a budget meal plan that looked at that particular cultural group and what they would eat on a regular basis. So in South Africa, we've got different cultural groups. And it's very important to come up with a meal plan according to that particular person's culture. Yeah, so important. Yeah. So important, something that we in the United States just completely seem to ignore. Right. That di different cultures are going to eat different ways. And if you tried to get that cultural group to eat in a, in a completely different standard or, or, or cultural standard, it just would fail from the beginning, right. regardless of what, how beneficial it was. So that was, I think that was a very good insight for right. you to approach it that way. And so we did demos, food demos. We then also had partnered with um, a company called Banting Boulevard, who's one of our affiliates. Mm -hmm. um, and they created something called Heba Pup. So a lot of people in South Africa eat porridge. We call it pup, um, Afrikaans word. Okay. And um, we needed to create a low carb porridge. And so they came up with something as close as possible to the traditional pup. And so we taught them how to turn that into porridge, how to turn that into bread, how to turn that into a stiffer form of the porridge, and then how to pair whatever they were eating with that. So, for example, if, if it was meant to be curry and or, or spaghetti and, and um, I mean, spaghetti and, and mince or something like that, it would end up being the mince with um, cabbage uh, okay. that was sauteed in an animal fat. I mean, you know, so a, a cheaper fat. So we, right. we, we encouraged them, to, we taught them how to render fat. You can get fat from butcher for free and then you can cook it down. And funny enough, the community, when that was taught to them, they went, hang on, that's what my grandmother did. Oh, isn't that interesting? And so it was taking them back to, this is the way your people used to eat. Yeah. And so... It was amazing. Within five weeks, people had lost over 11 kilos. And 
lowered their blood pressure, having been on four or five blood pressure medications. And, you know, the, the norm, what we in the low-carb world know is the now the norm. But to see this and for people... So normally when you have high blood pressure, as you know, when you're on four or five different pills and you go to the clinic and the doctor says, you're obviously not taking your tablets. And one of the ladies actually said... I would go to the clinic and the doctor would say, you naughty patient, you're not taking your tablets. Okay, now let me come see you first. And within three or four weeks, her blood pressure was completely normal, obviously on those five agents, and she would have to be reduced. The blood pressure, the meds would have to be reduced. But it was all these wonderful stories and seeing how practically we we could do it on a low-budget diet. Yeah. That's, uh, That's a great lesson. I mean, that people are budget conscious and culturally conscious and you found a way to fit that. So were you able to then take that model and, and expand it to other societies, other cultures, other groups of people? Yes. So so what we do is we customize every plan based on the cultural gr- group um, we're busy with. Yeah. So we each intervention has obviously taught us more and more. The issue for me personally is that you cannot... Exp- the, we're bombarded by uh, food industry. Mm. So you cannot expect real change if you do a six-week intervention and you don't follow up. And obviously with Eat Better South Africa being a non-profit organization, we rely heavily on funding. Right. Um, so without funding, there's only so much we can do because people need to pay bills and we need to pay people right. to do the interventions. And you're not getting the funding from the food companies, no. that's for sure. So we, 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 so we struggled uh, or... or should I say we're still searching for funding? Yeah. And we created the nutrition network. It was like an aha moment because we have all the science. We have access to all the great minds in the world, including yourself. And so why not create a network of doctors, firstly, or healthcare providers? So as a lone, as, as a first timer learning about the science of LCHF, You don't feel so alone. You have a community. You have a new tribe because I know how isolating it can be to start off and to learn by yourself. And which articles do you read? Which books do you read? Who do you follow? There's so much. Sometimes there's some conflicting advice. Sure. And so to create a network and a community of professionals who would support each other and there's no right or wrong answer. And even if, if, if you have something that's going lopsided, share it with the community and it, it probably is a point that we need to learn or we haven't heard about before either. Right. But the the great thing was to use this as an opportunity for funding. So the majority of the profits of the Noakes Fund Day, of the Nutrition Network goes into funding and we were so excited because um, I think it's now the third month that we've a- actually been able to uh, turn the Nutrition Network into actual real live donations towards Eat Better South Africa. So um, I think I lost track of your question there. <laughs> Sorry about so that. Okay, that was great information. Yeah, it, w- it was sort of um, talking about how you can have this impact and how right. you can make it work. So, I mean, that's that's wonderful. Now, how has it been received, though? Because if you're if the doctors in the hospital think it's rubbish and mm. are tearing up the, the papers if they see the impact you're having on these communities, I mean, it, it has to open their eyes some mm. way to see these populations of predominantly poor people who probably don't have a high level of health care, who probably are ravaged with chronic disease, to see that slowly starting to change. Are mm. people starting to wake up to this a little bit? I think it's still a bit of a drop in the ocean, yeah. the work that we've done. Um, I feel like there's still so many lives that need to be changed right. that... The f- it's almost like we've gone through a phase and now we need to j- sort of uh, adapt the game plan a little bit. We recently met with the chief director of health in the Western Cape in order to, because that was the issue, that seeing the patients in the community is one thing. Right. And then when the patient needs to follow up with a community doctor, we need a doctor who is equipped with low-carb knowledge. So in some communities, we've been able to partner with GPs and to get them through our course and to pay them to see our patients. But we haven't been able to do that in all the communities. Mm. And these communities drain to public health. And so we have uh, something budding at the moment with the local regional hospital that have been sold 
Uh, we've met with them and presented uh, the voter health data and um, from the super all the way down to the head of the medical unit have said, actually, we're not in a position to bargain anymore. We don't have space in our wards. This is crippling us. We need to do this now. And, um, you know, so, so we do have some um, hope coming up into, you know, the, the um, specialist physicians who have done the course in the local hospitals and are trying to make the change within their hospitals. Yeah. You know, it's obviously the wheels turn slowly, but I have to go back to what I believe, it, which is that it does take one person to make a difference. So even if it takes forever, th there's, there's a long-term plan. So you have to look at the 20-year plan rather than wanting to see those results right away. Right. It'd be nice if we could see them it right away, be, but yeah. you can't lose sight of that long-term yeah. plan. That's a great, great point. Now, you're obviously very busy with everything you're doing with mm -hmm. the Noakes Foundation, Nutrition Network, Eat Better South Africa. But in addition to that, you also have your own private clinic where you see patients one-on-one. -on -one. Right. And in addition to using nutrition as a, as a powerful tool to help them, you're also a big proponent of other aspects of a right. healthy lifestyle. So tell us what else you think are some of the important factors that people need to focus on to help them beyond nutrition. So I think that even though nutrition is a big part, it's actually a small part. Really? Because I feel that we have lost touch with the the human intelligence, our own inner intelligence and our body's own capacity to heal. Hmm. And that people are very much, perp the, the successful people in the world are very much purpose driven. And when you have a patient coming through your doors who's giving all the power back to you, I don't want to accept that power because it's pressure. So my job is to help that patient facilitate. I, I'm just the facilitator. Right. Helping that person journey back to the intelligence within. And so what I do is I have um, a questionnaire um, that I go through and I focus on uh, and I use the 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 well the wheel of health the wellness wheel, and I used to feel it's it's ongoing learning, uh, you know, in, in life for me, uh, as it is I think for all of us. But right. uh, in my practice, I used to feel this pressure to get the patient on the journey and have the patient on that journey and successful, and I realized with patients falling off the wagon and I, I took it personally, like I'd put so much effort into teaching this patient and why could they, they're so empowered, they're so intelligent. Why is it that they're not following this advice? And I realized that that was my ego speaking because mm -hmm. I needed the patient to succeed because I needed to feel good because I'd done something and that my ego had no place in healing. Yeah, isn't that interesting how the ego can just sort of creep in there? Absolutely. Even yeah. though you think you think that you you're passionate and you're you're living your dream and you're doing this this good work, it's got nothing to do with th with that. You know, it's, the ego creeps in. Yeah. And so I had to have this hard conversation with myself and realize that I can just ring the bell, and I am but one healer in the patient's life and in the patient's journey, and it's. Every interaction is important, and especially that it's not that every patient that comes through the door is actually bringing me something, and that I'm learning from that patient. Um, and you know, in uh, with my medical history, I've had I've got so many stories, as I'm sure you do, that you would see generally you see something like uh, as weird and wonderful as a dislocated jaw, just once in a while. And we or a, cerebr uh, a cerebellar stroke, you would see, you know, one every couple of weeks, um, or vernicus aphasia, or those weird and wonderful things. And why is it that you see that three times in a row? For, uh, suddenly you see it, and then the next day you see a patient with something, the same thing with a different clinical kind of presentation. Mm -hmm. And I only learned now that that was nature's way of teaching me that it wasn't that it, 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 it didn't just happen that it happened to teach me that different clinical syndromes can present in slightly different ways yeah uh, you know and I've had loads of these um, kind of clinical experiences and so I firmly believe that the patient is there to teach as well 
So I um, now would prescribe, and I say that within inverted commas because I don't prescribe anything. I give some life um, sort of guidelines. But for me, sleep is very important. Stress management is very important. Teaching the patient um, how to balance their parasympathetic nervous system with grounding and breathing. Um, so you work a lot on stress management I and work sleep. On, and absolutely. And managing yeah. especially your circadian rhythm because mm. the body is doing its very best to heal at every any given moment. Yeah. And we interfere with that. But if we create that optimal healing environment within, and if we give the body the optimal nutrients and we give the body the optimal sleep timing and environment in which to sleep, yeah. um, and when to eat and when not to eat, and we have faith that the body we use this to heal. You know, those are the fundamentals of, like sleep is a fundamental healing tool. So not only do I address the um, specific issue that they've come in with, because mostly people are coming in with diabetes or hypertension, right. or the metabolic syndrome. We end up talking about trauma that the patient experienced that hadn't that they hadn't processed, childhood trauma or or other trauma. Um, you know that that kind of thing. Right. Do you find it can be overwhelming that it's a little too much at once for some people and it, it, it overwhelms them? Um, so what I do is every new patient who sees me gets an introduction to the type of work that I practice so that it's not new to them that we're going to be talking about all this kind of stuff. Right. That's not just medicine. So they come in prepared. I also say to the patient that this is a journey, so it's like an a la carte menu that I'm going to be creating for you. And you choose w what you want to focus on. Right. If you want to choose sleep, you choose sleep. And then, you know, it will be beneficial for you to keep your carbs under 25 grams. And and maybe, you know, some, the, you have to meet the patient where the patient's at. Sure. And every single patient is, is individual. And, you know, and uh, on, on the contrary, people are overwhelmed that for the very first time they're able to speak about themselves. And all of the stuff that they hadn't processed or they hadn't spoken about. I mean, it doesn't all happen at once. Yeah. My first consult can go over two hours. Right. And then after that, it's just an hour or half an hour. But just to ring the bell in certain areas, what's your priority in life? Family, career, religion. Okay, so how much of that are you actually putting effort into on a daily basis? And then they go my family is really important to me but I'm giving them a 2 out of 10 in real terms so that's something that bothers me okay so how can we what do you think we can do to improve that yeah um, you know and then so they come up with with the answers and I just guide a little bit or suggest a little bit those are things we're not taught in medical no. school and residency but it has so much to do with caring for the person in front of you absolutely yeah so what kind of advice can you give people because not everybody's going to get a doctor like you let's face it so what kind yeah. of advice can you give somebody on how they can help themselves through this journey if their doctor is maybe not on the same page so for anybody listening, the three books that I suggest people read are um, Dr. Wayne Jonas's How Healing Works, mm -hmm. um, and then The Circadian Rhythm by Dr. Sachin Panda, right. um, and Why We Sleep, um, and I forget the author's name now, but sleep is just so topical at the moment. Um so that's the first thing. And if you go to Dr. Jonas's website, and I've got absolutely no affiliation with him, I've just found him as a resource, and mm -hmm. it's amazing, the things on his website. Um, he has some templates that I've started using, the kind of questions that you can um, ask. What I also suggest is perhaps email those questions to your patients beforehand and give the patient time to go through that the questionnaire and come back to you. And then you put a lot of stuff in the parking lot. Yeah. There's only so much you can tackle. And what we want to do is to cultivate a journey and a relationship, a long-term relationship with the patient. And my number one bit of advice would be start working on yourself. Yeah. Because we lose, f we lose track of the fact that we're human as well, that we need that family and sleep and when to eat and relations and community and rest. And we work too hard. And so what's behind why you're working so hard? Mm -hmm. w what are you trying to... Are you trying to run away from something? 
Are you? What is it? And so can you be brave enough to tackle those individual questions? And a lot of introspection. So absolutely. It can be uncomfortable for a lot of people. It is. And, if, and yeah. I think every, every single person needs to see a therapist because it can only be helpful. Yeah. It's healthy and wonderful to talk about yourself, to figure out what makes you tick. And that to me is key. Start looking after yourself holistically. Right. Exercise regularly and do the things that you love and make time for family and sleep and follow your passion, most importantly. A lot of people make the mistake of studying or working hard towards a certain thing and they don't go back and reassess and say, is this still my passion? Mm. And it can be devastating to realize that your passion has changed. Right. I mean, I had to go through that journey when I, I basically changed careers. And it was a huge moment for me. Um, it was a really difficult time because I didn't know who I was anymore. Um, I'd, I'd worked so hard towards this dream job. That it became your identity. And absolutely. Yeah. And when I had cut back and, and had to look at who I was and why I was trying so hard, it came from a feeling of inner lack, mm. a feeling of not feeling enough that I had to do all of this for other people in order to feel because that's what that's what I knew I knew to I, I knew achievement and when I didn't achieve I felt like I wasn't enough as a person right and so I had to do a lot of intros introspection and a lot of brave and hard work and work on that and feel enough and realize what all that was about and all the wrong messaging that I'd picked up along the way yeah so what we eat is clearly important, but it's so much more than that. It's about how we see ourselves as people, how we see ourselves in the world, what our place is, right. and all that, it, it impacts your health in so many different ways. And what's what I find so interesting about what you're saying is I can just see how when people have that awareness, when they're when they're able to see inside themselves, they want to take better care of themselves. And that will, that will sort of then almost be a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're going to eat better and you're going to exercise better because you're going to prioritize these things once you have that awareness. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's such a great insight and I hope I hope people really can take away um, some of these pearls from that to realize how they can start to take better care of themselves and learn about themselves and that there isn't always going to be somebody there to help you get started, but this hopefully will be sort of a kickstart for a lot of people. Um, and then help them on their journey, which I know is your, your goal and your passion. Well, what I do believe is that there's a new revolution of inner awareness out there. And so you, wherever you are in the world, you won't struggle, even if you're listening to podcasts, um, self-improvement podcasts, you won't struggle to improve yourself. There's a plethora of books coming out about self-improvement and self-mastery. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's a wonderful time to be alive. It sure is. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your message with us today. If people want to know more about you and hear more about the things you're doing, where can they find you? So I, uh, write on, I actually spend a lot of time uh, sharing on Facebook under Dr. Hasina Kaji Cobb Free MD. I've kind of lost interest in growing my website because, you know, that takes a little bit of time, but right. I, I'll, that's still under construction. Um, so that's pretty much, I spend most of my time there. I don't like to split between Instagram and Twitter. And so I find it's much easier to just stick to one platform at the moment. Um, yes, or you can email me at info at drhasinakaji.com. Very good. All right. Well, thank you for all your work and for all your passion. Thank you so much. Thank you.